Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Today we're going to be covering something interesting. We've talked about it a little bit before, uh, but these are some objections. Seven common objections families have when utilizing trusts in their estate planning. Good morning, John. How are you? Good morning. How are you, Eric? I'm good. I know Michael is with you, but I know that you're going to be kicking this off today for us. We've talked about trusts in past conversations and past podcasts. And if you're listening to this and you want to go back, uh, take a look at the website. I know that they've got a lot of the podcasts listed there. Go back and listen to some of those. They're, they're very, very interesting. and They cover a lot. But today we're specifically talking about objections. Where do we start with this topic? Yeah, I think first we have to start with, you know, the trust concept itself and, and how important it role it plays in estate planning and generational planning. I refer to the backbone of an estate plan because these trust structures, and there's all different types, and we can go through a few of them today, but trusts are designed on, on a lot of fronts to do a lot of very different things for families generationally. But the principal concept of a trust is protecting the wealth that transfers through the generations. But Mike is going to discuss today on, on these trusts on why people are afraid of them or how how they feel about them and the impact that they think it has on the family negatively and, and positively. So I think we're going to spend time today just uncovering that they're not a scary to- – it's not a scary topic. Uh, they're very important parts mm-hmm. of an estate plan. Uh, as I said, it's the backbone of, of what we do with families. And again, the major th- thrust of these trust designs is to move assets generationally and also protect them and also make them very tax efficient. So with that said, I'll let Michael jump in and start the conversation on why people don't like trusts. Michael, you're on. Hey, Dad. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey it's Michael. Quite the intro there. Yeah, it's, it's a big lead up. You have a lot of a lot of um, pressure now. Uh, yeah, but, yeah but, I know. I better I better live up. To it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a third, so he's got he's got to run with it now. Yeah. yeah, before well, I, we I, get into it too much, Michael, I know that there's a lot to cover. I know that in past conversations, you've been incredibly thorough and incredibly helpful in in teaching me. I mean, honestly, I've learned a ton from you, and I don't want to rush through today. Is it possible that we could split this into two podcasts if necessary? I think that is probably a good decision. <laughs> yeah, I okay. think with depending on how, how we can go. And again, there's seven of these objections and we may you know dovetail into some other things as we go through these objections. So I think that's a good idea. All right. I don't want to feel pressured to march you through these seven. Let's go. Let's go. Let's uh, let's really get into each one and, and really kind of dive in and find out what's going on with people, where their thinking's at and where their their decision making's at and kind of the psych- mm-hmm. psychology behind it, if you're OK with that. Sure. Well, I, I think it's it's also important if I could take a few minutes and really Really just talk about really what is a trust. Oh, and, please, and yeah. Because we, we've had a lot of conversations with families and they've had some misconceptions about what trusts are. So mm-hmm. I think it's helpful, at least for, for this podcast or, or, or even prior podcasts or future podcasts, for the listener to understand really what a trust is. Mm-hmm. I think that's helpful. And, and in, in terms of, of what it is, it's really it's, it's a way for someone to give property to somebody. So I give property to my father, so my father owns legal title to that property, but I have instructed my father to only use that property for the benefit of someone else, third party, hmm. let's say you, Eric. Then that's really, in its simplest form, what, what a trust is. You can think of a trust like a box. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a box that holds assets, and there is a person that holds legal title to that, and that person is called the trustee, and the trustee is charged with managing and distributing that property on behalf of a third party, i.e. the beneficiary. And that's really what a trust is. And very typically, those trusts are memorialized in a written agreement where I, in my example, would be called the grantor or the settlor of the trust. Those are two common terms that are used. And so I will outline how I want the trustee, my father in this case, to manage that property and I have a legal document that memorializes my wishes. And that's really what a trust is. So I think it's important to keep that in mind as we're going through this conversation here. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to put you on the spot uh, just for a moment. For everyone who's listening to this, as Michael goes through these things, I want you to be thinking of questions that you have. I want you to be thinking of kind of the the 
fallacies that you've heard or the things that you've thought about with trusts. And if we don't cover something in this podcast or the next, at the end of this podcast, I'm going to have them give out an email address where you can email your specific questions in uh, to, to their group so that they can get those answered or we can address those on the next podcast. Great. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's perfect. That's 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 exactly what we want. I mean, I, I think especially for this topic, having more education is is really important because again, as my father said, these are are pretty much a touchstone of of generational wealth planning, which is what we we do with our families. And so it's really, really important that families understand this piece of the plan. Yeah, absolutely. So why would a family consider a trust in the first place? Well, as my dad said, there's really well, there's quite a few reasons. One is is I would say asset protection is one of the major reasons why families consider trusts. And if you want to go back and learn more about the asset protection risks facing families, you can listen to uh, I think two earlier podcasts that we have on that. Mm-hmm. And and if you uh, listen to those podcasts, really one of the tools to prevent those asset protection risks is by utilizing trust. So when we look generationally with families, these trusts become a really, really key and important part of that asset protection planning. So that's the major, one of the major reasons why a lot of families utilize them. Um, Another reason is, is tax minimization. So we talk a lot and do a lot of estate tax planning with the families that we work with. And if you own an asset in specific types of trusts, which are called irrevocable trusts, and we may have mentioned that on some other earlier podcasts, but any asset that is owned in an irrevocable trust is out of the estate of the family, as long as it's designed properly. And doing so, or do, doing or designing a trust that way will actually remove those assets from the estate of the family really generationally or, or forever. And so when you're looking with families that have a high net worth that are trying to minimize their estate tax liability, these trusts become really, really important for that. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're also uh, utilized to control access. So again, from an asset protection standpoint, a trust can be drafted to control how assets or those assets are utilized on, be- on behalf of the beneficiary. So if you have a family that maybe wants to have some additional controls over how their family has access to to the family's assets, these trusts can be utilized to do that as well. Hmm. All right. Management is another key issue, I, I would say. It, it, so some families we talk to, they, they either don't have a family leader in future generations to be able to really effectively manage those assets. And again, as I talked about how these trusts are designed, the, the trustee is the party that is managing or really holds legal title to the assets that are owned by the trust. And so that trustee may be a professional or may be better qualified to manage the assets than the family themselves. And so that becomes a really, really key a, a, a point why families utilize trust as well. And then probably finally, I would say the, the biggest thing, another big reason why is privacy. And if we talk about the probate process, which we, we can get into a little bit if you'd like, but the probate process, when you pass away and you have your, your assets that are owned in your name, they typically are, become a part of your probate estate. And they, that becomes a public process. Assets that are owned in trust are not a part of that process. So if you have families that are very concerned about privacy in, in administering their estate, trusts are, are a very, very key reason uh, why families utilize trusts. Yeah, in our white paper that uh, we put together a, a, a while back, one of the key questions we ask families right away is your estate documents public or private? It's a, it opens that door that Michael just talked about. So it becomes a part of a very important dialogue on protecting the information, protecting the value of assets out generationally. I would assume that if there's information out there that's public, we already know that there are a lot of people that will take advantage of that. So I, I have, what have you seen as far as when something is in probate or family has have gone through situations like that? Have you seen examples of where – I don't want to just say scammers in general, but really people that would take advantage of people in times of distress. You know, obviously they've lost a loved one. Have you seen some examples of that in your career? Uh, I I haven't personally yet because I think most of the families that we work with uh, utilize these trusts. But Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've come across anything in your career where that's been an issue. I certainly know in the public sphere you can you could you know, have a whole host of, of, uh, you know, whether a celebrity passes away and didn't mm-hmm. pass away with a will that comes up all the time where there's maybe beneficiaries that, uh, or, or family members that, that come out of the woodwork and want a share of that, of that, uh, asset or the estate. That's really where the public process can really derail a family's yeah. plan. 
Yeah, I had a case a while back, and and it's a it's it's not an interesting story, but it was a client that I that I had his aunt passed away, and he was telling me a story that he st- all of a sudden getting calls because he was the trustee of the trust. He started getting calls from a from from a bank and some other professionals uh, asking questions about if they could be any assistance to the family, knowing that he was the trustee. So somewhere along the line, the information got out, and the only logical per, you know reason was that someone read the document or someone went to the courthouse and read the information. Mm. Uh, I'm assuming that, but that's that's happened in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well one of the things I would jump in, it, 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 when, you, when you take a look at these trust discussions, they become emotional too. I mean, this is a very, very – interesting part of our dialogue with families because we'll get into the objections in a, in a few, but it starts to un- unravel with, with the families about um, what is asset protection? Re- why is that important to me? What, why, why should I be concerned about that? And if you read any data that's out there about wealthy families, the chances of them being sued are, are a lot a lot higher percentage uh, because of their wealth. Mm-hmm. I mean, there seems to be a trend in our society that that's actually the case and there's evidence to prove it. So so asset protection becomes that emotional, I want to really protect the things I built for my family and not and, and not risk them to bad people that are going after those assets. From Because you know, remember, the grantor typically that created the trust is no longer here. The trustee and beyond handles the trust going forward. And and we have a saying: you can't really manage from the grave. You do the best job you can with these designs and these trust structures, but you hope for the best. That's why we talk about legacy letters and mission statements as part of our our design of these uh, estate planning conversations as well. I'm so, uh, sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to go down, down that road. No, no, that's good. I, uh, and I think when you start talking about asset protection and and wealthy families either being sued or having uh, creditors come after them, that's really we we really talk about that in our earlier podcast on asset protection. And that's one of the key reasons why or key key asset protection risks that families have. So that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. It, just let's let's put it very clearly. If someone sues me, they're getting about fifteen bucks in an old broken down <laughs> air conditioner. I think you know, so it's not like uh, people are hunting for uh, Eric to sue because they just know they're not going to get uh, too much from the turnip, right? Uh, so sure. I can I can completely see how wealthy families could be targets, and and it sounds like trusts are one of the ways where you can just securely, not I don't want to say hide, but protect the family from, from looky loose, right? I mean, you mm-hmm. see in the car accident on the side of the road, everybody's rubbernecking. And, and I guess that's kind of the, uh, an analogy, if you will, for this, somebody dies and people want to know, well, what do they have? Oh, they had this beautiful, huge house. They must've been really, really wealthy. And, and so maybe they'd start to dig and they start to look at, at what they possibly had. Um, it's not a hobby I've ever taken up, but I'm sure there's people out there and, and this at least allows the family some privacy. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you think about why, I, I just want to finish my comment on the, on the family emotional piece of it. If you think about a family of wealth, they, they spent their lifetime creating it. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about people that you know, Eric, that work 90 hours a week building a company, building wealth, sacrificing family uh, time, uh, sacrificing watching the soccer games for the kids on, on the field. It's hard to imagine that he would take this wealth and and waste it on not structuring yeah. the transfer of that wealth properly. And that's where these trusts become, as I said, the backbone of what we focus on with families because we don't want, we want to make sure we perpetuate that wealth for the generations as long as we can. Mm-hmm. All right, Michael, let's jump into the objections. I know there's seven to cover and we'll cover a few on this podcast and continue to the next. So where do we start mm-hmm. today with objection number one? Well, the first one we hear a lot is really a statement from the families that say, we're not rich enough to have a trust. Mm. Or we, I didn't think that I qualified to have a trust because I, you know, I, I didn't have sufficient assets to, to qualify for one. And, and really, there is no financial benchmark, if you will, for when you qualify for a trust. If you are a family that's concerned with asset protection or concerned with uh, privacy and administering their estate or having a professional manager uh, manage the family assets, then a trust could be for you. It really does not matter uh, w- w- how much assets you have to be in order to qualify for it. So that's really the first one, which is which is a pretty quick one. Is <laughs> I think it's really not much to talk about. I mean, trusts could be used for everyone. I have them for my family. I know we have them. Uh, Dad, you have them in your family um, it, between between you and mom. So really, trusts again being that backbone. They're, they're they're important for everybody. It doesn't matter how rich you are. So that's really the first one. And I would assume that no. 
there's, I mean, there's a lot of trust. I know that one of the podcasts, there's a ton of names that we brought up uh, for the different types of trust. And I'm assuming just the complexity of the trust themselves kind of dictate what it's going to cost to set up. I mean, I know mm-hmm. there's a lot of a huge process. So I, I would assume that the amount that you have in, in assets just has to justify the type of trust that you're building, correct? Sure. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different types of trust, as you pointed out, and that's really where the structure of the family's assets or their goals of what they're trying to accomplish may may necessitate going to those, let's say, more advanced type of trust, which we'll probably cover quite a few of them in more detail uh, on future podcasts. But but in terms of being able to implement a very simple trust, that you can do that pretty easily within a will, as an example, or you can have a separately drafted trust that without too much additional expense from a um, legal drafting standpoint, that could accomplish a lot of these goals that you're trying to accomplish. Gotcha. All right. So objection two, let's, and, and should we jump right into that, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, the, the, the second one is we typically hear from families is, well, trusts are too complicated. I don't really want to deal with having a, a, you know, a legal document that really controls how, you know, my wealth is distributed to my kids. I'm just going to leave all of my assets to my children, as mm-hmm. an example. It's mm-hmm. just too complicated for me to go through that. And I think that that objection has, to a degree, some merit because it, it is certainly more complicated to have a trust than to just simply say I leave all my assets to my kids or to my grandkids or whatever the case may be. That's pretty easy to have an estate plan that's drafted that way. However, we, we start talking about all the asset protection concerns or all the other privacy concerns that we alluded to earlier. And so families very often really aren't thinking of those issues when they make that statement that trusts are too complicated. And so I think it's a balancing act. And when we have conversations with families about that, very often they, they, they lean towards having a trust incorporated, even if they wanted, let's say, more simplicity in their estate plan. Gotcha. And so how do you how do you help them overcome that objection? I mean, it, I know that there's a ton of different types of trusts out there. How do you start that process of finding the the right type for the family that that will help them to understand that it's really not as complicated as you think? Well, I think that it's really a part of the conversations that we have with families. And we, again, we spend a lot of time going through how, how trusts work and, and the different components of it. And really, actually, that's a good bridge into the ob- objection three, Eric, which is a lot of families think that assets are locked up in these trusts, that they mm. don't have access to them. And I, I, I put these two objections sort of back to back because when you start looking at the complexity of the trust, you could have the trust language that that essentially says, I want my, all of my children to have regular ass- access to the trust assets. And it's a very, very common provision. It's a, it's a relatively simple to administer from a complexity standpoint. And so you can really custom tailor the language of the trust to really accomplish the level of asset protection you want or the level of simplicity that you may want and still in many ways get the best of both worlds. So that's really when we go through that design phase, we're sort of fleshing that out with the families to, to determine how the trust language should read to, to best accomplish what they want to accomplish. Yeah, and I, I, I jump in sometimes in that conversation when Michael has this with our clients. When they say it's too complex or it's too too complicated, I usually say compared to what? The mm. complication occurs is when you don't have a structure and you send these assets to the wind and you send them out to two or three family members or beyond, that's more complex because what happens in that circumstance? You know, there's marriages that might not be, be working real well. There's maybe children might have some addictions along the way. There's some other complications uh, far greater than having a trust structure to protect all that. So we, we, we kind of have reverse psychology with it where compared to what? You're, you're walking into a windstorm by doing it this way. A trust softens it. It brings it into a structure that allows you to be flexible with that structure. So you shouldn't be afraid of the complexity of it. The complexity is really not that big of a deal because once once you understand the language of the trust and we'll help you through that, they become very simple to understand. I mean, that that's how we, we approach it. Well, that's a great point, Dad. Thank you for bridging into that because I forgot to talk about asset fragmentation, which is a, another reason why trusts are used. And it, again, when you start talking about complexity, if you imagine we have uh, we had one family that owned a family business and the, as the family business was, was passing down the generational line, the trusts that they did have incorporate trusts in their planning, but the trusts expired at a certain point in time. 
And at that point in time, all of the family business assets, which was it was an oil business, they had separately. I don't know how many two hundred eighty-two oil wells. Oil wells. It, was, uh, it, it was it was a lot of a lot of assets all being distributed out to to the the family members, the three children, and then some of the grandkids as well. And you start looking at that, and they say, okay, well, how are you going to divide those assets up? Who's going to get what? Which which oil well produces, you know, produces more or mm -hmm. less oil and revenue? And so it becomes really complicated in that example. But even if you have a, a, a piece of real estate as an example, is it more or less complex to have, let's say you have three children and you leave that piece of real estate outright to your to your three children? Well, are all three of those, those children going to be able to make or come up with one decision on the future of that real estate? So there's a lot of a lot of these different conversations. My dad said sometimes reverse psychology is important when you start looking at, okay, well, compared to what? Because you can make a, a pretty compelling argument that it's not more complex by utilizing, utilizing trust. It can actually simplify things. Okay, so I want to recap. We've covered three objections, and I think that's where we're going to probably end today because I, I do have one question that's going to take a little bit more time. The first objection was, well, we're, we're not rich enough. Well, I would I would say that you answered it very clearly, uh, and I think the, the other answer would be, you're definitely not too rich enough to have the conversation with John and Michael to find out if a trust is, is right for you or not right for you. So make the phone call. So there's, we just overcame that one. That's done, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. number two was trusts are too complex. And number three, assets are locked up. So I want to ask one question and, and this, hopefully you can both address this. The difference between a will, right? And, and a trust. If somebody says, oh, I've got a will. And, and I'm leaving all this stuff to, you know, my kids, I've got three kids, I'm going to spread it out between the three of them, so on and so forth. That's what my will says. And then you have the opportunity to build a trust. And that's different. It's a different scenario. I want to talk about a time frame because this is what I kind of always think of. And that's where I think it kind of leads to the assets are locked up. If I make a will and 10 years go by before I pass, a lot changes in 10 years. How does a will compare to a trust in its ability to function correctly, if you will, or function the way you originally wanted it to 10 years later? Well, first off, we would say you shouldn't wait that long to look at your, your estate plan. I mean, we, we look at estate plans with our families pretty much on an annual basis, but I think at a minimum, most attorneys recommend every five years, especially if you're you know adding family members, you're having children, grandchildren, mm -hmm. or you're growing a business. So yeah, that's a great point, Eric your estate plans constantly evolving as your family evolves. So, you know, you shouldn't, A, you shouldn't wait 10 years to look at this. Oh, but, I agree. Uh, if, if you are, as an example, to, to, your, your question has a little bit more detail. I'll try to keep it at a, at a high level. But mm -hmm. when you create a, a will, you can actually incorporate trust language within that will document. So when we talk about having a will, we use the term simple will, which basically says, I leave my assets to my children or I leave my assets to my spouse, mm -hmm. as an example, outright and free of trust. That's what we call a simple will. You can incorporate l trust language within your will itself. The challenge with that is it's incorporated in your, in your actual will document, which is filed with the probate office. So when we talk about having privacy in your estate, you can actually incorporate a trust within your estate plan but it's still a part of your will and it's still a part of that probate process. Does that make sense? Yes, got it. Uh, so, and that's a, when we go through our audit process with families, that's one thing that we, we actually touch on because very often we see families have trust language in their, in their estate plan, but it's incorporated within their will. And because of that, it's a public document. Mm -hmm. So very often a trust is a separately executed document that's apart from your will. And what your will then says is, I leave all of my assets to the ABC trust, as an example. Mm -hmm. And that's all that your will says, and that's all that's filed with the probate office. This is a little bit of a, a maybe it was more detail that you were looking for, Eric. But no, that's, that's great. That's, way, that, that's a way in which you can incorporate a trust within your estate plan fairly easily to accomplish all of the, the um, as, asset protection and privacy objectives that we uh, we talked about earlier. Gotcha. Because that's my, we've, we've talked about you know, families where children have gone through addiction issues or grandchildren have addiction issues. And that's kind of what I was thinking about when asking that question is if I just have a, I guess it would be a simple will. 
you don't know what happens in those 10 years or those five years. If, if mm-hmm. I'm not working with Copper Beach and I'm just working with, you know, Joe Schmo, the attorney who doesn't review it every year with me or every even five years with me just says, hey, you've got a will, you're good. A lot can change. And all of a sudden, maybe I don't want all this cash going to this person who is going to, you know, possibly harm themselves with that. So, you know, a trust, I think, is is kind of what your answer is, being able to make sure that the person who is managing the trust is able to make those decisions on how it's dispensed, if that's what you've given them as far as their, right. their power. Yeah, yeah, now you're getting into the language of the trust, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. controls a lot of those decisions. Got it. So, for example, my personal trust, Michael's my trustee. I created the trust for my wife, Debbie. As long as she's alive, she controls the trust. When she passes away... Michael steps in and takes care of my daughters. Mm -hmm. Now, our trust design where Michael has full control over the trust, he has discretionary powers is what they refer to. So, for example, my my wonderful young daughter, Alicia, who's 30 years old, says, hey, Michael, I want a Mercedes. Uh, you know, give me a hundred thousand bucks. Michael's going to say, yeah, maybe a Hyundai works. You know, they really may <laughs> need Mercedes. Although Michael has the decision process where he says, you know what? We, we have enough money in the trust. If she wants a Mercedes, I'll give her, I'll give her enough money for a Mercedes. So Michael has the second set of eyes on those requests. Got it. So that's where that distribution of assets or that locking up or unlocking assets become a part of the conversation, how the family wants that to work. See, I wanted my family to have full access to my trust, but with a protection to it, which mm-hmm. was Michael as that discretionary power as a trustee to make those decisions on their behalf. Because let's say, for example, I'll, I'll pick up my little daughter, Alicia, as well. Oh, she, man, you're really, yeah, know, she's really in the whole family. family. <laughs> she's probably going to well, listen to Let's pick up Laura. Yeah, I'll pick, pick up, up pick my little Let's Laura. say Laura marries uh, – she's actually she's getting married in August. She marries this wonderful guy, Pat. Uh, but let's say 10 years from now, their marriage is struggling. And um, Michael knows that. And they're trying to work it out. And they're trying to you know, come up with an agreement to move forward as a as married couple. But now Laura says, Michael, I need, uh, we want to buy a piece of real estate. Can you give me money out of the trust? Michael would say, well, let's talk about whether that should be purchased inside the trust, which means it's not subject to that divorce potential mm-hmm. issue. Or he could say, you know what, I'm not real comfortable with you and Pat are with your relationship. Let's hold off on that decision until you guys kind of get your life squared away. So it's really not uh, you're a gatekeeper, but you're flexible with making decisions for the beneficiaries of that trust. Interesting. Versus having a clause that says at age 35, 500000 comes out of the trust to Alicia. Yeah. Now what? Got it. See, that's where that – that now what? Now you, you have unknowns. She could be mm-hmm. in a very bad situation in her life, and you just wasted all that money that you you created through your hard work, and it went to the wind. So that's why yeah. these trusts become a living, breathing document, or as I keep referring to it, is the backbone of our estate planning to make sure these families have every option possible to them to design these trusts with flexibility. And they're not locked up forever or they're not inflexible unless you want them to be. Another short story I had a client um, years ago. The trust was set up by their grandfather and the trust language was so strict that the, the language says this trust can never invest in anything other than a treasury in the U.S. government. Mm. Now, if you think about the last 40 years of the stock market, the, tr- the family member is saying, listen, we need to invest this money into the stock market. We're stuck in this low, these low-yielding assets, especially over the last 10 years. And the trustee said, can't change it. It's an irrevocable trust. Language, language, I can't change it. So, so you have to be careful when you write these trusts up. And Michael can probably dig deep into a lot of those discussions. But we un- un- uncover all these conversations where the client now has four, five, six different concepts. Say, okay, here's how I want this trust to be drafted. I want flexibility. I want to have some money go out to the kids, but I want most of it protected for the generations. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of variations involved. Um, and I hope that answers some of your questions. Well, we, we take it we take it very seriously, that these conversations that we have with families. And, and I think there are many uh, attorneys and advisors out there who, who will do a similarly good job in, in sort of fleshing out these issues. But far too often we see documents that were just kind of haphazardly drafted and, and they have real impact. So when we 
we spend a lot of time with families going through this because as you can you can already see from these objections there's a lot that goes into this design and it's important that families as best they can understand what their options are so they make the right decision for themselves and their family yeah absolutely now we've covered the first three and we're going to have to cover the next four on the next podcast is that okay with you guys that's perfect yeah Yeah. all right thank you guys for your time i appreciate it pleasure thanks Eric. eric All right. And thank you all for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have Joe Schmo attorney like I do and they have not covered or gone over your estate plan or your your will in the last couple of years, you need to you need to reach out to Copper Beach because they'll uh, they'll be happy to have that conversation with you and just say, hey, let's take a look. Let's see what you've got set up and see if it's if it still fits. But more importantly, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services Incorporated, a member of FINRA SIPC Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors Incorporated, an SEC registered investment advisor. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of APFS and APA. Any opinions expressed in this forum are not the opinion or view of American Portfolios Financial Services Incorporated APFS or American Portfolios Advisors Incorporated APA and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors.